my folks, my mother and father, my mother was born in New York, and uh, my dad was born in Indiana, and they found out that Goodyear was hiring, and so they decided to, this was in 1930, in the 1930s, so they decided they were going to come to Akron because there was work here. And so uh, we lived we lived there in Goodyear, over in Goodyear Heights, and uh, the, our four children were born there. And uh, we went to school, barber school in Akron, and then the Depression was so bad in 1935 that my dad moved the family out to a farm in Brimfield, which is 10 miles east of Akron. And uh, we bought a farm out there because we could raise our own food, which worked out quite well, too. And so I, we moved out there in 1935. I was in the fourth grade. And uh, I continued my schoolwork out there at Brimfield School until the ninth grade. Then all the students in Brimfield went to Kent State University grade school. There was a school there that we whose pur purpose was to teach student teachers how to le learn how to teach. And uh, so I went out there and I worked until the war started in 1940 and they asked for volunteers to work in machine shops for uh, things for the war. And I, for my last two years of high school, I worked as a machinist, apprentice machinist, and making submarine battery molds. And, uh, well, I was normally more of a C student, no D's and F, but I was more of a C student. But in order, while I was at Kent State University, they brought air cadets into the college to learn to be pilots and so forth. And I admired them so much, and they were all so nice looking, and won all the girls. And so I, I did, made up my mind I was going to have to be a B student to do it. So I studied real hard, and I brought my grades up to a B. And uh, then in 1943, I was drafted, asked by my friends and neighbors, became drafted into the service and, uh, in, in 1943. And uh, I went through basic training. I, I, I went through this basic training down in Georgia. You were drafted in the Army Air Corps, correct? Pardon? You were drafted in the Army Air Corps? No, I was drafted into the regular Army, but then they sent everybody to basic training. Mm -hmm. So I went through 17 weeks basic, and when I graduated from there, they asked for volunteers for the Air Corps. They needed guys capable of the air crew for the uh, air corps, they're called air, air crew cadets. And uh, I took the, I went to Cochrane Robbins Air Force Base down in Georgia, and we went through a battery of tests, and uh, a lot of them were, didn't, weren't healthy enough. Fortunately, I was raised in the farm, and I was very healthy, and uh, I was able to pass the physical and the mental test mm -hmm. to apply for in I was qua I qualified. Then they sent us to Miami Beach, Florida, when it was just an island, and uh, we had to go through uh, to see if we were capable of flying a plane, if we had the qualities and the necessities in order to be in the air crew. And uh, these guys were all for the air crew. They were for the pilots, co-pilots, bombardiers, and navigators. And uh, I qualified for that also. And uh, I, I was qualified first as a medium bomber. And so I went to a school that was teaching. It's to, I went was shipped to Sioux City, Iowa, where I went to school for 15 months to, to fly <coughs> a B-25 bomber. And after 15 months, we were ready to start flying these bombers when uh, general Arnold, who was the general of the Air Corps at that time, he said, I'm sorry to tell you this, but uh, we have some air superiority over Germany, and we don't need as many pilots and so forth, that uh, we're transferring you to the infantry for the invasion of Europe. 
Of course, they couldn't tell us that because that, that's supposed to be a secret. Mm -hmm. But uh, our whole 500 guys at, at uh, Sioux City, Iowa, Morningside College, Sioux City, Iowa, the same school that Ann Landers went to. She was a senior when we were freshmen. And that was kind of interesting because it was an all-girls college. And anyway, then uh, they shipped us to uh, Camp Miles Standish up in Iowa. And <coughs> we went through some basic training and so forth. Then we were all, the, as a division, they had previously sent all the privates and PFCs in the 76th Division over to England for the invasion. They put all the air cadets into this division. The cadre was still there, but they put the privates and PPC all to go through a short training cycle. And, and, and uh, we went, went over to England, Southampton, England, and uh, getting ready for the invasion, which is 19. June 1944. Okay, now you want me to stop there? No, go ahead. Well, then uh, after we got to England, then we had to go and get our supplies and everything, and uh, we were assigned to uh, 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 okay, land, land, landing boats, <laughs> whatever they were called. They were all different kinds, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, we were loaded on these landing boats, and then on June 4th, June 6th. Well, how long were you in England for? We were in England probably about 30 days. About 30 days? 30, 30 to 60 You stayed days. in Northampton all the time? Pardon? Did you stay in Northampton at the t uh, all that 30 days? The 30 days, uh, there was a thousands and thousands of GIs over there, millions mm -hmm. of, mm -hmm. in England that had accumulated over there, and also all of the people who had gone up through from Africa up through Italy, mm -hmm. they also were coming up through there to getting ready for this June 6, mm -hmm. 1944 invasion. <coughs> LSTs, uh, landing ships, uh, troops. And uh, I was assigned to one of those troop ships, and uh, we went over to Omaha and Utah Beach, which is the landing. There were seven beaches in France, and uh, we were not assigned to the one with the hills, but the one next to it. The, the one with the hills was where most of the guys were killed and, and wounded and so forth. And uh, we were right after them, second wave. Um, they call it, somebody told me they called it D1. Pardon? Was that called D1? Oh, well, they were t called Utah, and Omaha and Utah Beach, then there was a French Beach, there was an English Beach. Yeah, I mean, like the second wave, one of the vets told me that was called well, D1. Was they the weren't second wave. actually waves. No? They were constantly, there. Uh, I understand there's like 3,000 ships out in the ocean out there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I should add to this that the reason that our, our invasion was a success was because it's Hitler had gone home for an uh, occasion, whether it was his birthday or something, and he was told to not be disturbed, and so he didn't call on Rommel to take his tanks down to where we were invading. They thought it was a false invasion, so they left us invade for almost two days before he got his troops organized up in the northern part when we invaded in the southern part mm -hmm. of France. And uh, that enabled us to establish a beachhead. beachhead. And uh, when we landed on the beach, I waded into shore up to my waist. And uh, because they were... What beach was that, do you know? Uh, well, one's Umit, Omaha, and one's Utah, the second one, whichever that is. It was either the north beach of the Americans landing. In this, the South Beach, the, the fellows that had a lot of experience from Italy and coming up through Italy, they had a lot of experience <coughs> and they had them crawl up their hills with ropes to get up, up, get up on, the, on the beach. Now, it was a little more flat where we were, but our problem was that uh, they had machine guns firing at us coming ashore mm -hmm. and uh, we had the idea that it, because we had our airplanes 
uh, blow up the bombs and things were planted on the beach and we had to go from bomb hole to bomb hole to get up to shore and uh, you had to watch up on the shore when the machine guns were firing down the beach you'd make a run for another hole and they'd fire down through mm -hmm. and you'd run from it, you'd go from holes to holes you, it, it was about the length of about two football fields from where we, the, when we went in, at the tide went in, and uh, they, there were a lot of steel bars and things there, and the planes had bombed away a lot of them, but uh, we had to work around them and, and work our way up to the beach to get over the hill. The paratroopers had landed in back of them, so they were eliminating some of them, mm -hmm. but they couldn't eliminate all of them. And, uh, but, but, uh, it actually took us two days before we actually established a beachhead. And uh, then from there, to make the story short, we went from there to... Howard, can you tell your story. I'd love to hear it. Oh, it <laughs> tell me a little bit, you know, about yeah. life and... There was a city very mm -hmm. close to this north beachhead where the Americans were. It was called Cain, the city of Cain. And our job was to take this city, and we lost a lot of people. By the way, on the beach, uh, there were uh, 15,000 killed, and about that many wounded. And so you can imagine the mess it was. You know, mm -hmm. and you actually had to hide behind bodies in order to survive to get ashore and get up onto the beach mm -hmm. far enough, and uh, which was real terrible. You know, mm -hmm. and. Uh, then we had to take the city of Cain because the Germans had well, they awakened Rommel, who was go went to a, a party or something, and uh, they didn't. Th they thought it was a false invasion. They thought we were going to uh, cross the from England over into France, up closer to England instead of down in Normandy, and so that gave us time to establish a beachhead and to get our equipment ashore, which was terrible. But uh, we we sunk a lot of cement ships offshore to land our equipment to get it ashore. And they put balloons around the tanks and the, the trucks and the things to get them to shore. And, but we did uh, enable us to... You guys sunk? You sunk? Cement trucks, what for? Kind of like a bridge, kind of, or uh, these were cement. These were landing ships that were made out of concrete, and they sent them just offshore, mm -hmm. as close as they could get them in. And uh, but we had a big storm on the fifth day there, and uh, it worked them out. But by that time, we had established a a other areas that we could get things ashore mm -hmm. and uh, to get enough equipment so that we could fight Rommel and his tanks coming down from oh, across from uh, England. <coughs> and uh, we were able to get that to this city of Cain, which is about 25, 50 miles north of where we landed on the beach. And it took us uh, five days to take that city because pa uh, 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 Rommel had his tanks over there. We had blown up the bridges that we could. The paratroopers and I, I never who ever could blew up the bridges so they couldn't travel. Mm -hmm. They had to build bridges to get down there, and that gave us a, a foothold. And we almost lost it. We almost got pushed back in the ocean because he had all his troops there. And uh, but uh, that it it took probably two to three weeks before we were strong enough. And then we finally broke out of the encirclement, you might say. And we had enough equipment, enough of material, because there were thousands of us, a lot more than he had. Reminds, you must, must remember that the Germans were also were fighting the Russians. Mm -hmm. And so they had to have a lot of their people over there. They couldn't spare having too many where we were. So that gave us a little bit more advantage also. But when we broke out of that landing areas, we were pretty strong, and we were able to push the Germans. How did back. you guys um, 
I mean, did you choose? Who chose the landing area? Is it just the beach? I mean, how did that come about a little bit? Well, that was all pre-planned, and it, it, okay. they, one of the things when you're in the service, when you're in the Army, they don't tell you anything, mm -hmm. because if you get captured, they, they can squeeze the, what you're doing out of them. Mm -hmm. But it was an amazing fact that they were capable of keeping this a secret from the Germans, that we were, we were not going to just cross the channel and land in, in France. That the idea was to go down Normandy was about 200 miles south, and they weren't expecting us there. It was bad weather. It wasn't the typical kind of time to try to make a landing. But uh, Eisenhower decided at the last minute and said, "This is our only chance. <coughs> We're going to take a chance of it." He postponed it a couple of times mm -hmm. because the bad weather. And then we finally got a little bit of clearing enough that these thousands of ships that were paddling around out in the ocean, they, they all got together and, and came to these landing places. There were actually seven beaches. There was the, the French, the, all, all these different countries that were fighting. The, the English had a, a beach, the uh, French had a beach. Uh, the, uh, each country had a different beach of their own, and we had two of the southern beaches mm -hmm. near Normandy. And uh, but the, but this, the, the big, biggest thing we had to do was to get past those guns that they had implanted. They put thousands of depth charges on the beaches as we had to blow up too in order to get ashore. But uh, we were there were so many of us, and so many of us were killed. But uh, we were able to get past that point, and uh, we finally had a foothold. So then we pushed the Germans back into France, back into uh, uh, Holland and Belgium, and uh, our job was to try to get to Luxembourg. Now Luxembourg is uh, just part of Belgium, but uh, our our job of our 76th Division was to get to this point in Luxembourg. So, and we were successful in getting there, but we had to fight battles going up there. The Hertzkan Force battle, which I had a battle star for, and <coughs> we got up to uh, right just about where the Battle of the Bulge was. And uh, uh, we, we uh, our division was involved in taking the city of Echternach, Luxembourg, and uh, we had to go store to store, and it was an interesting, I'll throw this in at this time, <laughs> we had to go through it. In go ahead, I'm sorry. Sure, that's okay. But we had to go from through all the buildings because there were a lot of snipers, because we're getting in close to German territory, mm -hmm. and there were snipers all over the place, and we had a terrible time. But, uh, I remember going into this store, and uh, the roof was blown off, but uh, I, then there was a back door. I went into the back door, and there's a man sitting in a, a chair, a, kind of a comfortable chair, but uh, it was such a shock, but he didn't have a head. And uh, uh. But these were the things that I couldn't talk about before. Yeah. You see some of these things, you know, that you can't talk about, but I got over that too. And, and, uh, but then uh, I, another interesting thing happened when we were there, when we got to Luxembourg and uh, got to Echternach, Luxembourg, and right near there, uh, is that's when the Battle of Bulge was about to start. And uh, uh, Hitler re realized that they were going to have 15 days of the cloudy time. Their planes couldn't fly. And he took advantage of those 15 days before it started. It was snowing, 12 inches of snow in, in the Battle of Bulge. And uh, so uh, they, just before this happened, though, there was an interesting thing. <coughs> we were in, sleeping in foxholes, and uh, they, we, we had to go back and get our supplies from the rear area. And uh, we just had leather boots on. We went to the back area. Everybody had rubber boots on except us. 
And I went back as their leader. I went back and asked them, "Isn't there anything we can, way we can get these rubber boots? Because it's, these foxholes are watering and snow and all, you know." And uh, well, there, our cap captain and Tingley said, uh, "Here comes the man to ask, and here comes Patton in his jeep." Wow! It was actually, Patton with his he was three stars across the jeep, you know. He said, go over and tell that man right there. I said, I can't, I'm only corporal at that time. Mm -hmm. I said, I can't time him. He said, I understand. He says, but you stay right here. I went, and he walked over to Pat, and he says, we've got a problem. These guys in the box holes are they're got getting trench foot because their feet were freezing. Mm -hmm. And it, it was 15 degrees, by the way, and 12 inches of snow. Anyway, uh, we were losing troops that way too, and Patton called all the guys in the rear area together. He says, "Now, you see all you guys out here. The guys in the foxholes don't have rubber boots. I'm coming back tomorrow, and anybody that doesn't that has boots on is going to trade places with the guys in the foxhole." Well, that was a very interesting thing that happened to us. Anyway. Did you actually get to meet him, all, or just what? Did you actually get to meet him, or? Uh, just by distance, yeah. Just, you know, acknowledged him, you know, you just, yeah. I acknowledged that he did, I did see him. He was a rough and tough old guy, you know, <laughs> and he was what they told about him, too, you know, he was not very popular, mm -hmm. and, I, and I didn't get along with him very well because he had different ideas than I did. Mm -hmm. <coughs> because of my background and experience I had, I had ideas of my own, you know, what we should do and shouldn't do. But he he was that uh, damn the torpedoes full speed ahead, and I didn't have that idea. I said, mm -hmm. you carefully invade, you know, surround and invade and all that sort of thing. A little, a little more strategic or whatever they say. Pardon? A little more planning and, you know. Yes, planning mm -hmm. and uh, avoid. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, you, you didn't have a chain of chance just to go in where there all those snipers and things were. I said, you have to stay away from trees around the buildings and so mm -hmm. forth and became careful when you advanced mm -hmm. <coughs> and uh, that it saved I, that's when they made me a I, I wasn't a full sergeant but they made an acting sergeant because we had lost a lot of our leaders you know and uh, because all of these guys are, are air cadets they were leaders they were all were actually leaders and uh, we were using good judgment against Patton's thought, and he he didn't like that. He uh, we had a lot of trouble about that. I I never got my stripes because I wouldn't do what I was told. They wanted us to go up near the front line and see what's going on up there. You can't do that because they're sitting there with a gun to shoot at you. So I I said you just have to creep up at night or whatever and listen and see what's going on and, and sneak back again. Well, they didn't like Makes that. sense, doesn't it? <laughs> it makes sense, yeah. Mm -hmm. But anyway, then the Battle of Bulge happened. And of course, everybody knows about the Battle of Bulge. And, uh, and uh, I reported back to my captain and so forth. I said, now we know they're getting ready for an invasion. And uh, we talked to him. He says, well, the captain said, I told them down it in, in Luxembourg, Luxembourg, where their help, their uh, planning was about the front. And uh, they said, well, that they're just having maneuvers over there. And uh, we told them, no, that's not true. So then on in, uh, December 16th, then they had the Battle of the Bulge. And uh, so I told all my men, and I passed it on to the other men going on, on both sides. <coughs> the only way you have a chance of surviving is to get behind a tree, bury yourself under snow, walk backwards off the trail, get behind trees and bury yourself, because these tanks are going to be coming through there and they're going to be loaded with Germans. 250 brand new 60-ton tanks were used in the invasion. And they just walked right over us. And uh, anybody got in their way, they just machine gun. Yeah, and this history is, talks about the situations we got into. So but you guys had buried yourself in the snow? I buried myself 50 times. I had to walk 35 kilometers 
<coughs> to our best. Uh, best on was was west, and uh, so we. Just, I told everybody to scatter. Don't bunch up. If you bunch up, they'll machine gun you. Mm -hmm. But if you're by yourself and you're you go off to one side, they won't bother you. Well, it, it saved a lot of lives, and uh, and in fact, I I got a bronze star because I got the the fellows that were hauling the troops back to get dry clothes and warm food and uh, do it better equipment. And uh, I said, now we're going to be picking you up in 10 trucks and take you back to the area where you can get resupplied. I said, but now there's a possibility we're in the Hertzkan forest. And uh, they, we're, we don't know where the Germans are and they didn't know where we were. But I said, in case we run into them, I, I, we have to, have to have a plan. Mm -hmm. I said, when you do run into a bunch of Germans, we're going to have to try to encircle them as much as we can. It's hard to do in a forest. But we circled on the, each side of them and started uh, surrounding before they realized what was going on. And I told the guys with each truck had a 50 caliber machine gun on top of the cab and making a lot. Of, and we said, just make them think that our trucks are full of GIs. Do all the firing you can. The Germans gave up and we captured 200 Germans and put them in our trucks and took them back prisoners. <laughs> That's where I got my bronze star. Mm -hmm. So I didn't actually do it, but I instigated mm -hmm. it. But uh, this just myself, but these guys that I was with, were, they were all cadets. They were pretty smart cookies, you know. And uh, we worked together. And I, I'm not trying to take their credit, but <coughs> we tried to keep alive. <laughs> yeah. So. Then, the, of course, the Battle of Bodge lasted three months. You probably heard of that, mm -hmm. read about it. And, uh, but uh, I, I walked backwards until I met Patton coming up from the south to relieve the, the, uh, the... They had completely surrounded this, this part of the area and uh, well, we we were just individuals, and we joined up with them as best we could. And uh, they, uh, I we walked east as best we could. I had a I was the only one that had a compass on my watch, so I knew which way to go. And I told the others to watch <coughs> somebody that had a compass, so they'd know which way they're going. Because usually you walk in circles if you don't. And uh, Anyway, we went the 35 kilometers, and we met Patton coming from 100 miles south to his in his front was, and they pulled him off that front and sent him up to the Bastogne, and uh, so we all ended up there as best we could, and uh, it, then we finally took Bastogne, and then pushed the Germans back into Germany again, and. Uh, so then we had to reform our division again because we'd broken up so bad. And uh, How many men were with you at that time, do you know? Well, I was in D Company, 304th Infantry. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, and uh, we were a heavy weapons company. We had 70 millimeter guns, too. Uh, you know, the, the ones that you fire with 70 millimeter shells. and. Uh, we were in a heavy weapons company, and we really had more firepower than they did. But uh, I, I should add at this time that that was just about the same time that the Germans uh, had invented a bomb that would it would explode ten feet above the ground, and you had to dig your foxhole deep enough so that the the, uh, the flak from hitting the trees and exploding and going down in your foxholes, you had to dig down deeper. And, uh, well, I'm going to throw this one in at this time because it was kind of interesting. Uh, we had a, got a lot of replacements because we had a lot of casualties. We got a lot of replacements. And uh, I was actually at that time only a corporal, but they gave me a replacement that was a, a you had been a mess sergeant, a staff sergeant 
and he would not do anything I told him to. And uh, so uh, when we dug our foxholes, when they were bombarding us, uh, he he dug down to made himself a little chair to sit in in the foxhole, and I went down two feet below that when it was firing at us, and uh, they fired in the shells, exploded, and went over my shoulder, hit him right in the chest, uh -huh. and I was stuck in that foxhole with a with he hit with a shell. And uh, that was one of those things I could talk about, too. I bet. There's, there were lots and lots of things like that. Uh, but that those in particular comes to your mind. So yeah. then we reorganized and got together, and uh, we started across the rivers <coughs> going into Germany itself. And uh, 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 when they, the, I can't think of the name of that bridge, that uh, didn't sink in the water, that uh, they we discovered it was still standing. Uh, I can't think of the name of the bridge. It okay. doesn't, doesn't matter, but uh, it's in history, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, the bridge was still standing, and we were able to get some of our troops across the Rhine River over this bridge before they blew by the Germans finally were able to blow it up. It was a real old bridge, a hundred years old, made out of stones, and it <laughs> bombs didn't. You made it well back then, huh? Yeah, they didn't have a chance <laughs> of being it. But mm -hmm. we anyway, we, we finally got across the Rhine River, and uh, then uh, we went over. That was Cologne, Koblenz, were the two major cities, and we were in between that. And our division was supposed to take the city of Kassel, and uh, which we did finally, but. Uh, we got over there, and uh, they had us so well guarded that we couldn't do anything with it. We had to back off and call the airplanes to come over and bomb them before we could take the city of Castle, which is very close to Co Cologne and Koblenz. And uh, then, of course, <coughs> we had several battles on our way, and then we got we went across Germany and had little battles here and there, but uh, we ended up over at the Elbe River, which is down to the center of Germany, and uh, the Russians were coming from the other direction, and uh, they we met up with them on the Elbe River about 50 miles south of Berlin, and uh, they were on one side of the river and we were on the other. And uh, <coughs> it was interesting, uh, the, we weren't allowed to go across the river, but the Russians were, and uh, well, that was where the war theoretically was ending there, and uh, so their guys would come across in little boats or something, and we fraternized and talked to them, you know, and it's surprising, a lot of them could speak English, and they'd always have an interpreter, and we got along real well, but it was an interesting thing, uh, when we had to part after about five, ten days, we had to go to our section of the guiding, the, the one both sides of the river, and uh, there's, I met this Russian soldier, and he was able to speak some English. And uh, when when we had they had to go home and we had to leave, uh, I they were admired my wristwatch that had a, a compass on uh -huh. it, and so I I. Should, I, the last thing before and we parted, you know, he wanted it so bad, I took that watch off and gave it to him. This, this is kind of hard to say, but uh, he went back over the river and he showed, by the way, the, the Russians brought their women and children and all their supplies on the Conestota wagon. They didn't have tanks, they didn't have trucks, they didn't, they traveled because that was not the important part of the battle. These were people on the outside of the battle. Anyway, they brought their whole families there. Well, these people are all lined up on the other side of them. And uh, this fella went back over, and he showed the people his wristwatch, and everybody over yelling. <laughs> I, I made good connections uh, yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. It was kind of yeah, I'm strange. surprised they had their families with them. I never heard that before. Pardon? I never heard that before that they would actually bring their families with them. Yes, they did. Uh -huh. Well, we furnished them with a lot, a lot of equipment, you know, because 
when the Germans countered it, <coughs> the Germans <coughs> countered attacked and pushed in Kermis to almost to Moscow, and they wiped out the whole countryside. They killed everybody, burned all their farms and everything. They just wiped out all their equipment. They lost hundreds of planes, and uh, they just couldn't compete with the Germans in all their first-class equipment because the Russians didn't have that much, although they were getting stronger, but only in spots. <coughs> and they they were within, in with almost within Berlin. I'm sorry, I should turn that down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. I don't know how to work this thing now. I'm going to turn it off. Okay. I apologize. Go ahead. Okay. I usually try to remember that. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. So, anyway, that that's the way the Russians were fighting the war at that, that time because they just didn't have good equipment and we had to furnish them. <coughs> we always knew that when we did see trucks over in Russia, they were Studebakers. We had GMC trucks, they had Studebakers. And you could tell because one had a flat windshield and the other one had a V-shaped windshield. And that's the only way you could tell mm -hmm. one from the other. But we furnished them thousands of trucks and things for mobility. When they counterattacked the Germans and pushed their way back down towards Berlin. And uh, this was the the way that that happened because they could not stand the winter temperatures up in, in Moscow. They weren't prepared for it really. Mm -hmm. But uh, anyway then. I've heard that the <coughs> cold almost helped the Russians because they were, yeah, they were used to it. Yes, the Russians were used to it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, my daughter has a Russian hat. I see. It's like the Russian horn. They uh -huh. just have eye for the eyelets, you know, <laughs> over their ears and everything. But they did have good clothing, though. Mm -hmm. They were dressed, and the Germans weren't. Uh -huh. So that's why the, the, the Russians were able to push them back down towards Berlin. <coughs> I'll, I'll get back to where our part of that was, what I was involved in. Uh, when we met the Russians, and <coughs> they did, <coughs> they moved us from there. They, at that time, the war was officially, you might say, was over. <coughs> well, they divided Germany up into four sections. The English, the French, the Belgium, the four sections. We had to move out of there and take our equipment and move down to Altenburg Airport, which was just on the, near the city of Prague. And uh, Altenburg Airport was a huge, big airport that had a big dock about the size of Akron Airport, dirigible plant there. And they had, they brought all the prisoners and put them in this airport in there. And uh, I was given the job of taking a fleet of 10 trucks to go over to Prague. Anyway, we had to move from Altenburg Airport. After we bring, oh, we went, we had to take the 10 trucks and uh, go on into the mountains in back of the city of Prague, which is in that country, whatever that is called in Prague, Hungary, <laughs> and uh, uh, we had to get these, the, the German soldiers, SS troopers, didn't want to be captured because they just sent them up to the, in the northern Russia and work them to death. So they couldn't be, they wouldn't be, uh, they just get rid of them, you know. And uh, so we had to, humanity for ideas. We we went back in there for some reason and picked up truckloads of so the German SS troopers and brought them uh, to Altenburg Airport. So they wouldn't be sent to uh, Siberia? Siberia, uh -huh. yes. That was what was happened to them. Mm -hmm. Same thing happened to the, the Polish people. The Polish people fought on both sides at one time, you know. Mm -hmm. When they first started out, they were on one side and then after the Russians came down through there, then they were on the other side. All the Polish soldiers were sent to Siberia too. That's I read in the book, yeah. But that, that was interesting, that even though they fought for the Russians, 
Mm -hmm. The Russians were that that kind of people. They they, they, uh, they destroyed them more or less. But anyway, when we left Altberg Airport, we were assigned to Hope, Germany, which is about 50 or 100 miles south of Altberg Airport. And uh, when when we got down there and it got established, it, it was kind of another interesting thing happened. Uh, I was in, in, in charge of a truckload several truckloads of trucks hauling our equipment to our new location and that uh, we loaded all our equipment, all of our the supplies and things that had to move from Altenburg Airport down to Hope, Germany. What and did you do with the prisoners? Well, the prisoners had to be interrogated and uh, they had they generals. At the base? They had generals, they had all kinds of those people and I've got pictures of them, of them being where they were interrogated, where they were held in the thousands of them, thousands of them. Yeah, this is a huge building, and I heard there were several like this around the country too. It was very close to where they had those concentration camps, you know, where they burned the bodies and everything. It was very close to that kind of part of the country. And uh, they asked me to go there, but I couldn't stand to mm -hmm. uh, see the sight of that. It was such a horrible. But when we were moving our equipment down, the Russians tried to stop us and inspect our trucks to see what we had in them, you know. Well, we had just helped them win the war. And uh, we stopped the first time. And uh, I told my, t my lieutenant, I said, now look, I'm not going to stop for them and let them mm -hmm. inspect our trucks. I said, well, they don't have a right to inspect our trucks, you know. So the next time I went down through there, I told the guys in the trucks, they had machine guns on top of the truck. I said, don't shoot them, but shoot over their heads mm -hmm. and see if they don't get out of our way. So we made about 10 trips back and forth holding our equipment. And they never bothered us anymore. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we, we finally made our move down to Hof, Germany, uh, which is about 50 to 100 miles south, down to the American sector of Germany. And uh, then uh, they were getting ready to you know, the, the war was over and we were just dividing off. And then they decided they were going to take the guys that didn't have enough points. Mm -hmm. They were going to send them over to the invasion from Japan. And so they, I only had 73 points and a lot of guys had 100 points because they fought up through Italy and so forth. So that I, we who had less points went to Compiègne, France which is about a hundred, about a thousand miles across, all the way across Germany to Compiègne, France. And we re issued our equipment. We had winter equipment. We had we switched to khaki equipment. And uh, we loaded everything on our truck, on our trucks. And we were going down to uh, southern France. Uh, I can't remember the, the, the port of Depart down on the, uh, southern France to get on a boat and go to Japan and we loaded our truck with all our equipment and everything and uh, it came over the loudspeaker that the atom bomb had dropped and so we had to unload our stuff and then th we didn't have to go to Japan then the, the people just in front of us had gone down to southern France and got on a ship and they got over the paddock Panama Canal, mm -hmm. the ship that was in front of the ship we were going to be on. When I came that close to going to Japan, <laughs> they said we would lose a million soldiers mm -hmm. invading Japan. So we got out of that. But uh, that meant that uh, we had almost 7 million. There were 17 million. I was told there were 17 million in the service in World War II. 7 million were in Europe. <coughs> we had a job of getting 17 million people back to the United States. Everybody that had over 100 hours or 100 points, they flew them home in those all the airplanes they had. Mm -hmm. But the rest of us had to stay in La Havre, France, right on the ocean, La Havre, France, right across from England. And uh, there was a big, huge acres and acres of camps for the guys to stay while they were waiting for a boat. 
And uh, because we were going to Japan, we were the first ones to go into the camp. And so they would post on the big, huge, big blackboard who was going to go on those ships. And I was scheduled to go home on the Queen Mary in about July, June or July. And uh, but before I could get on the Queen Mary to come home, the high with high points got ahead of us and pushed us off. So I had to do something with my time. I had to wait for three to four months before I could get a boat to come home. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I was, because of my uh, ability, I was given the job of uh, our master sergeant and I became good friends. He was, he was he was from Cleveland, and we became real good friends. And uh, when he he had the job of dispersing the prisoners of war to go into the little towns and cities all over Belgium to rebuild their city, get their water going, their electric going, and so forth. And that the Germans, would, uh, who had the ability, were given that job. If they did their job right, they were allowed to go home. And uh, but this involved thousands of guys too, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, but the sergeant, because he had, the, even though he's a master sergeant, he was in charge of that. And he gave me, when he left, he said I was capable of handling that job. So I had to go up to uh, at Belgium, the, the capital of Belgium. Uh, I can't think of the name of the capital of Belgium. Hotel Modern. Yeah, you never hear of y'all's hotel. I, I had an office in it for mm -hmm. three months, uh, guiding these Germans to different places to repair the damage that was done there before I could get a boat to come home. So then I went back down to Harp, got a, a, a boat, and went over to Southampton, England, and came back home. And uh, as you'll see on the drawings on the chart there, uh, that's the whole thing in the nutshell. Did you, where'd you come back? Did you come back to Brooklyn? I came back on Pier 12, Staten Island. I came back on the Wasp aircraft carrier. The Wasp aircraft carrier was one of the old models. It didn't have structure under the flight deck. And while we were coming home, we got, we got into a storm and the flight deck fell down on the front of that Wasp aircraft carrier. <coughs> the reason I learned so much about what was going on, it was a coincidence when I was on that ship that had 5,000 GIs on it, we had uh, bed five stacks high on that ship, and who should be right straight across me but our company clerk. And the company clerk is the one who has to notify people that are killed or wounded and so forth. And he was right across. Luke Asanic, I still remember his name. Yeah, and it was interesting to know about Luke Asanic because he was our company clerk. But it, with the name Luke Asanic, he had a Polish background. <coughs> and he said, well, clear, I'm going to tell you something. <coughs> I never told anybody, but I am 100% Jewish. But I could not tell anybody mm -hmm. in the service. And uh, so that I, I'm telling you, we, we communicated for a long time. Mm. Anyway, uh, we, we landed in Pier 12, Staten Island, we went to Indian Town Cap, Pennsylvania, and were discharged from there. But I could not tell them that I had lost my hearing and all those bombs and things were going off. If you told them or complained, they put you in a separate bunch of people and they sent you to Texas, to hospitals in Texas to check out why you can't hear, or why you, when you lost an arm or luck or something, they re recuperating, you know. And uh, my wife had had a baby while I was overseas. I had a little girl a year old, and I didn't want to wait for it, mm, so I didn't yeah. report it. So they didn't want to give me give me hearing aids until I told this story to the VA person who was running it. I told him my story. He got me my hearing yeah. aids. <laughs> That was kind of interesting too. Man, but uh, good thing you, you want to go home that, already. You don't want to go to Texas. That's kind of in a nutshell. Yeah. So how did you? I mean, when did you come back? What did you do for a living when you got back? Well, then when I got home, uh, I, we 
my mother and father had sold the farm because we didn't need the farm anymore. Mm -hmm. And uh, they they uh, moved back to Talmadge. And uh, <coughs> I, I was going to go, then they decided they were going to go to Phoenix, Arizona, which they did. They moved to Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, my wife and I bought a house trailer that we pulled behind our car, and we were going to pull that out to Phoenix. And I went out to visit out there. It, it was in June, May, you know, it was in May, and it was 106 degrees. And I did not want to work in that hut. So my dad said, I'll get you a job at Goodyear. And so, because I had worked as a machinist mm -hmm. making war, war efforts, uh, I was able to get a job at Goodyear as a repairman. So you worked there for how many years? 44 years at Goodyear. 44 years, yeah, wow. I, but I had about 20 different jobs at Goodyear. Mm -hmm. I worked my way up to supervisor and so forth. And, That's uh, great. But that worked out pretty good too. So you, you came back and you pretty much, I mean, how did you assimilate? Was, did you have a hard time assimilating back into civilian life? Or well, because... How do you guys, do, yeah, how do you guys just kind of... Yeah, but it, it narrowed that down. And uh, mm -hmm. I, when I was going into Air Corps, my wife and I, who had, we'd gone together for three years before, mm -hmm. <coughs> we, we got married and she followed me out to the Air Corps uh, taking that, going to that school for mm -hmm. 15 months. And she worked at Cuddy Peat Mac, at Cuddy Peat Mac Meat Packing Company. Mm -hmm. She worked there and she worked every place I went, 35,000. She went 35,000 miles following me through the service. And uh, then I, uh, then, okay. Message. That's not me. No, it isn't. <laughs> I, I, I'll just turn it off. It's okay. But she followed me every place I went. Right. But, but then when I went overseas, mm -hmm. she was pregnant. And so when I was in the Battle of Bolts, she my, had my daughter, Kathy. That was January 1944. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but uh, while I was uh, gone, she, her sister, lost her husband. He was a gunner on a, a B-25, and she lost her husband, and she had a little girl about the same age. So my wife babysat for the two, so the, the mother could work in the defense plant. Mm -hmm. My wife took care of the two little kids while I was gone for a year and a half. Mm -hmm. So then I worked for Goodyear for 44 years, but Abby and I, because of my ability to do things, we, we built or finished building a, a total of seven houses. Wow. <coughs> the first first five, I did part of each one of them. I finished this and finished that and part of them. But the last two houses, we built, did the whole house. We did everything. We didn't know. So we they're kind of like the first flippers, huh? Yeah. We did. <laughs> we first, first generation of flippers. Uh, in, including this this house here. Mm -hmm. We didn't have any contractors. Mm -hmm. My, we did it. It took us seven years, but we did it all ourselves. Yeah. That's great. And that way we could afford it. Yeah. Well, I thank you for sharing your story. Yeah, well, I, I, I hope you enjoy I doing it. I mean, it's kind of hard to yeah, right. go back and kind of remember some things. But yeah, you know, Jack Masters, uh, mm -hmm. he wrote down 12 things that I told the stories to them, you know different people over a period. It's 70 years, you know, that's yeah, a long time. Yeah. yeah. But we used to go to Krispy Kreme, and uh, we were very popular down there. And my wife was good at telling stories and everything. Mm -hmm. She was very popular. When she went to Krispy Kreme, there were 50 people in there. When she left, when she got sick and left, they all disappeared. Oh. Now there's very few people there. But Aww. she was such a nice lady, mm -hmm. real kind. Had a good talking. marriage. She was a, really a special lady. Aww. Yeah. That's but, uh, sweet. Time marches on, huh?